everyone, welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, Year 2, where this year we're reading through and studying the entire New Testament, one chapter at a time. Thanks again for joining us in discovering God's plan and your part in it. All right, everybody, this is a monumental day because yesterday we wrapped up Matthew and today we are starting Mark. We are, of course, starting back at the very beginning of the story. We kind of walked through the whole crucifixion and resurrection, and now we are back uh, in the beginning of Mark at the beginning of Jesus' story. Now, this is one interesting thing. We're going to hear four different perspectives of Jesus. Uh, and because we're not doing this chronologically, rather we're doing it book by book. If you were with us last year, you're used to like the chronological reading where we kind of read all the things in order. Um, this year, taking it book by book, we're essentially going to redo the story of Jesus. And it's cool because Mark is my kind of guy. He likes to be short, sweet, and to the point. And we are flying through this thing in 17 chapters, whereas Matthew was like, what, 28 or something? So I like it. Just just to prove that Mark uh, likes short, sweet, and to the point, he uses the word immediately in his gospel (laughs) 41 times. 41 times he'll say immediately. So Mm -hmm. he likes like basically skipping all the minor details and just being like immediately the next thing happened. Mm -hmm. So let me give you a little bit of background here. Uh, This is actually important. Seriously, hear me out on this. This is important to understand uh, the writers of each gospel, the purpose of each gospel, and kind of where it landed. Okay, so Matthew and Mark, uh, historically, we understand them to be some of the earliest gospels. We think this gospel was written uh, sometime between 50 and 60. So the temple is still standing. It has not yet been destroyed. Um, Jesus has been uh, ascended into heaven now for about 20 to 30 years, depending on when this exactly was written. The missionary journeys that we'll hear about in Acts are in full swing, uh, which is why like, it's important to our author, because our author here, Mark, is one of those missionary people. Uh, Mark pretty famously gets in a big fight with Paul, and Paul basically like deletes Mark from his missionary journey. So and this is all extra credit, but it's fascinating. Um, Barnabas originally takes on Paul to be like a missionary partner. Mm-hmm. And Barnabas wants to take Mark with him, but Paul doesn't like Mark because Mark has like kind of not been as trustworthy as possible. So Paul's like, hey, I don't like that guy. Um, so Mark ends up going on missionary journeys with Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas split. Uh, Paul goes with Silas. Mark goes with Barnabas. It's possible that Barnabas and Mark were actually related. Um, we will get into all that later. Um, but Mark is a missionary. Uh, he does quite a bit to move the gospel forward. And his gospel is based on firsthand accounts from Peter. So true to form, Peter cannot be bothered to write his own gospel. He just tells Mark about it and has Mark write it. So just when you thought that uh, your church wasn't super or was super dramatic and the Bible isn't, you're wrong. There's they, lots of drama, apparently. They did reconcile. Paul and Mark did reconcile. This is mm-hmm. all extra credit because we'll get into this like when we read Acts. But um, at, at, on his, uh, essentially almost his deathbed, basically, he's about to die. Paul's, Paul says, Paul's bring like, him here. I got to exactly. apologize. Yeah. So there is reconciliation. Um, the purpose of Matthew's gospel, which we just came out of, was to preach to the Jews that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. That's why Matthew uses scripture, like Old Testament scriptures, around 60 times at the least. So he's constantly quoting Old Testament scriptures. He has this clear understanding that his readers understand the Old Testament scriptures. Mark is speaking to Gentiles specifically. So he's going to use a little bit less scripture. And when he does, he's going to use better known scriptures. So an example here is he quotes... Um, a passage that that he could say comes from Malachi or comes from Isaiah, and he basically appeals to Isaiah because more people had an understanding of who Isaiah was. So even within the first, I don't know, 15 verses, we have what took us probably like three chapters in Matthew, the exact same thing. So uh, Mark opens up with these preparatory, as my one commentary said, these like preparatory things uh, for Jesus' ministry, which is John the Baptist being recognized as preparing the way for Jesus, then Jesus' uh, baptism. And then finally, the temptation of Jesus, which is really crazy because, again, like we are basically encapsulating all of these three major things in about not even 15 verses. Um, And then it just throws us right into Jesus' ministry. And then we begin to see a lot more 
details unfold. So it's like this really quick sweeping overview of like those first preparatory things. And and one of the reasons that it's really quick is because Matthew is trying to prove historically through genealogies that Jesus is a descendant of David. He actually describes Jesus constantly as the son of David. Mark is going to describe Jesus constantly as the son of God. Mm -hmm. The Gentile audience has not much of a history of all this Jewish stuff, so they don't necessarily care about who his parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were. They just need to know that he is the son of God. They would have some kind of understanding of who God is, not necessarily the God, but they would have an understanding of a God. And so Mark is going to be a lot more direct, a lot more to the point in a lot of ways, Mark writing this gospel for the Gentiles is really helpful to us because we are Gentiles and a lot of us may not have a ton of Jewish historical background and understanding. So it's helpful to us that Mark is like straight to the point. This is Jesus. He's the son of God. He has authority. Boom. And oddly, like to start off the entire book, I kind of almost forgot to mention this. Verse one says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. That actually caught my attention when Ryan was doing the reading today, because in other books you had mentioned earlier, Ryan, that this would have said the son of David through Abraham. Like it just like traces all the way back, which is really telling because this is, again, just like much more to the point. Like, nope, he's the son of God moving right along. Yeah, Mark is going to focus exclusively on Jesus' spiritual authority because he's just not as concerned about the Jewish historical stuff, again, because he's a missionary to Gentile believers. So he's writing a book that's going to help him witness to the Gentile believers that he comes in contact with. So I think it is helpful to think of Mark specifically as a missionary who's going into other cultures and trying to reach other people to teach them about God. And what he's going to focus on, you can see actually in chapter one, he's setting the scene that Jesus has authority in his teaching. Um, That's in verse 22. Basically, he's saying like he was able to teach like nobody else could teach. He taught this like new, incredible wisdom and knowledge that would have appealed like crazy to Greeks. Greeks were like all about wisdom and authority and wise teaching. So when Mark is like, hey, I know this extremely wise teacher, they'd be like, oh, tell us more. Mm -hmm. Uh, We also see Paul do that in Acts. Um, So he's proving that he has authority in his teaching, and he's proving that he has authority over sickness and disease and all things. Yeah, but again, when we called this out in Matthew, when Jesus begins his actual ministry, so after all of those preparatory things that we talked about earlier— When Jesus actually begins his ministry, he just flat out says, and I think this sets the tone also for what Mark is up to in his writing, but Jesus says in verse 14 and 15, um, he came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Like, that's the message. Get ready for what's coming within like all of these works of Jesus. Gospel today strikes us as like religious kind of sounding language, but gospel to them would have been like really important news. Mm -hmm. So gospel of God, they actually would have understood that this was like news that was meant to get their attention. Almost like, I guess, kind of like breaking news. Like when you see break, like the screen stop and breaking news comes across it, you know to pay attention. So when people are saying gospel, they know to pay attention. But he is. He's he's short, sweet. He's to the point. Repent. Believe. It's God. (laughs) And then from there, it just like spills over into all these things he does. Obviously, he calls his first disciples. I don't even think he calls everybody out in this. Uh, Mark doesn't call everyone out, but there are a couple that are mentioned. And then right into the healings and preaching. That's pretty much what the extent of the chapter is then. Like lots of healing, lots of preaching and teaching. He casts out demons. So like, again, imagine these these are people who it's intended for people who don't necessarily have the Jewish background. They don't necessarily have an understanding of the Old Testament. So he, Mark's just saying like, Jesus did this. Then he did this. He had authority over these demons. He had authority over these sicknesses. He had authority over these teachers. And it's like, this guy is not like any guy you've ever met because he's not just a guy. He's the son of God. So Mark is painting this crystal clear picture, very few details, very few supporting scriptures, just Mm -hmm. like this is who it is. Listen. Immediately. Yeah. (laughs) Immediately, which he says 41 times. Um, Fun fact, just extra stuff that we could dig into a little bit, just so you notice it. If you look in verse 30, uh, one of the people that he heals is Simon's mother-in-law. Now, this is Peter. 
So, so when it says Simon, he's referring to Peter. Remember, this is based on Peter's firsthand accounts. Mm-hmm. So Peter would have told him, like, yeah, Jesus started his ministry. And he came over. He actually healed my mother-in-law. She was really sick. Like, imagine Peter's giving him firsthand accounts, firsthand stories. Mark's writing it down. But it does show us that Peter was married. You can't have a mother-in-law unless you have a wife. So a lot of times we think about these guys as, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know if we always think about them as single guys, but certainly we don't consider their families very right. often. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Peter had a family and Jesus healed his mother-in-law. Um, so, you know, when we say that like these disciples like left everything and followed Jesus, they actually had wives to think about. They had extended family to think about and they still le- left them and followed Jesus. Sometimes they were accompanied by their families, um, but it did significantly change their family life. Um, we also see, I think this is important to, to highlight we're going to see multiple times in Mark's gospel, and we did some in Matthew's, that Jesus has this incredible habit of getting away from everybody, getting mm-hmm. to a solitary place, a quiet place, oftentimes in the wilderness or in the desert. Um, so here in chapter one, I think we see him do it two or three times to pray, to be away from everything, to to pray to God, to strengthen his relationship with God, even though he is God, he needs to like stay connected somehow to his father, who is God. So if Jesus had to do that, surely we should be doing that. Like mm-hmm. it's it's great to highlight the fact that solitude was important to Jesus and solitude is kind of a lost art to us today. Well, and if you think about like Jesus is perfect, he is God. So the fact that Jesus, who is doing these insane things, um, all these healings and teaching and preaching, all of this stuff all at once, the fact that he is perfect and doesn't necessarily like need rest I mean he does but like we are human and to compare ourselves to him it's like well if he's doing it certainly that should be something that we too are um, doing and trying to at least accomplish in our daily life and our lives are so noisy Mm -hmm. so noisy and actually maybe we're part of the problem don't hold it against us but (laughs) like most likely you're listening to this on your phone or on your computer or on like you're on listening to us speak on some device that is constantly bombarding you with notifications things to be entertained with things to listen to uh, things to check up on and that constant activity and constant noise draws us away from god so when we withdraw from that and we just seek the presence of god through silence It has an incredible way of strengthening our relationship with God and allowing us to hear from him better. Which I think could definitely allude to a your part for today. If there's nothing else practical, I think that is definitely huge. Yeah, it's it's definitely huge. Um, I think if you are not practicing solitude, uh, it it is actually like one of the core disciplines that we teach um, where I work currently. And when we tell people about it, you can always see you can always <laughs> see people that are like, oh, I don't want to do that. And and or probably like you just take naps. <laughs> <laughs> probably your experience is that even considering solitude is like frightening. Like, how could I possibly not do anything like that just seems crazy. How could I possibly sit in silence and the reason that you like like, the reason you should do it is because you actually are so like um frustrated by it like it's Mm -hmm. like enter into that silence enter into that rest it takes a little bit of practice to really start to enjoy it to really start to get something out of it but like any other good spiritual discipline you can't actually get good at it unless you start to do it so i do encourage you to enter into solitude if you if you want to start uh, try a half an hour. Uh, if you're like me and you just want to do it like from the start, take a day. Figure out a Saturday where you're going to be quiet. You're not going to have a device. You're just going to seek the presence of God and hear from him. Do it that way. Um, if that seems crazy, which I totally understand that that would seem crazy, um, you know, carve out half an hour, carve out an hour. Um, I don't know. How how would you do that, Jenny? Like you're you're a very busy stay-at-home mom. Like how could you possibly carve out that time? Here's the thing realistically it's best when the kids are sleeping so that is usually very early in the morning when I wake up and prioritize or it is like nap times during the day when everybody's just kind of doing their quiet thing and I have my own time I will say the best case scenario is when I'm awake early in the morning but you really have to just like fight your own like lazy tendencies, which I have lots of, <laughs> and it is hard to drag my butt out of bed. But um, I actually am a supervisor for some student teachers, and I have been 
really like hammering into them like hey if you want to be a good educator if you want to be um, like a good woman of God who is like reflecting the Lord and seeking the Lord you have to be putting the time in Um, and I think it's so true like we do this every day just because this is like a podcast that we do but there are days where if we like don't do it because it's the weekend it's like you can definitely tell like you can definitely definitely tell Uh, But having that time is so important. And it's not just a thing to say. Like, it really is true. You can tell that you're missing that connection with God. Yeah. um, Because we are designed to have that connection with God. Guys, there's so much more in this. I feel like we're not quite doing the chapter justice by making solitude our our your part for today. I think it's Um, reflective. (laughs) There's so much in there that you could dig out of it that you could um, apply to your life. So um, kudos to you for sticking with us to start the book of Mark. I am excited about what we're going to experience through this book of Mark, through this different lens. And I'm excited about how well we're going to know and understand the ministry of Jesus when we're done with these four gospels. Like Mm -hmm. we're spending a lot of this year with Jesus. I think it's a really good thing. So we'll be back again tomorrow uh, looking at Mark chapter two. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. As always, please consider partnering with us as we are a listener-supported podcast that we hope to continue to grow with support from listeners just like you. We've made it super easy to partner with us, and you can support us by following the link in our show notes or our description. You can support us with as little as $3 a month. Every little bit of this helps so much, and we're so thankful for your support. With that in mind, here's today's reading. Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down to untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit." In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boats mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding regions of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. 
That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place where he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it, and to spread the news, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. Don't forget, you can find us on just about every social media platform and YouTube. Let us know what you thought of today's episode, and if you have any questions, go ahead and post them there. You can also reach out to us directly at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. As always, if you don't have a Bible, or if you'd like to use the one that we use, uh, reach out to us via email, and we'll be happy to send one to you. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you again tomorrow.